Secretary of State for Education, Richard Holden. Question number one, Mr Speaker. Secretary of State. My department is committed to raising standards across the country and levelling up opportunities for all. Our £1 billion COVID recovery package includes a £350 million national tutoring programme targeted at disadvantaged pupils, and we continue to invest in the growth of strong academy trusts to drive attainment in areas facing particular challenges. Richard Holden. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. In Blue Wall constituencies like North West Durham and more broadly across the north of England, it's quite clear that the Government's lifelong learning announcement will really benefit people and communities disproportionately well, helping our Government's uh, levelling up agenda. What assessment has the Government made of the impact on earnings of individuals who will gain a Level 3 rather than stick with a Level 2 qualification? Well, my honourable friend raises an incredibly important point because there's so much evidence to point out that if people have an A-level equivalent qualification, the benefits that they will have throughout their life are significant, with an increase of 10% of average earnings for those who gain that. That's why our uh, lifetime skills guarantee is so vital to ensure that people right across the country have the opportunities we want to see all of our constituents have. Heading up to Glasgow North West with Carol Monaghan, the SNP spokesperson. Carol Monaghan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Educational attainment, of course, depends very much on the quality of the teachers. Now, in Scotland, teachers must attain a specified professional standard, which is not necessarily replicated in other parts of the UK. The General Teaching Council of Scotland have raised concerns about the Internal Market Bill and its implications for the profession in Scotland. So would the Secretary of State agree to meet with the General Teaching Council of Scotland to discuss these concerns? Um, of course, we would be always happy to meet. We now come to Chair of the Select Committee, Robert Halford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I think uh, my right honourable friend is right to delay the exams um, that was announced uh, today. Uh, could I ask him what assessment has been made of the students who missed learning over the past six months in terms of the catch-up needed and the learning they've lost? And what is uh, the plan if students are sent home um, in terms of ensuring that they carry on learning at home online? Well, I think my right honourable friend raises a vital important vitally important points to ensure that we have a continuity of education. I think every member of this House recognises the value that all children gain from being in school, being with their teachers, having the opportunity to learn. And that's why issuing the direction of continuity of education, making sure that schools are held accountable for delivering education, even if pupils are having to isolate at home, is so incredibly important. We need to ensure that every child, whether they're in the classroom or whether they're at home, are getting the education that they require. Sure, Thank you, Mr Speaker. With your permission, I'll answer question four and five together. High quality childcare supports children's development and helps parents to work, and therefore we're continuing to bulk buy childcare hours from the sector at pre-COVID levels, even if providers had to close due to the pandemic. 708,000 children attended an early year setting on the 1st of October, which is an increase of about 300,000 compared to the end of the summer term. And we've also encouraged schools to make sure that after schools and breakfast clubs are reopening. Many residents in Hyburn and Hasenden have contacted me regarding our manifesto commitment where we promise to deliver a £1 billion flexible childcare fund to support parents and children with holiday and wraparound care. What progress is being made on delivering on this promise? Can I thank my honourable friend for raising such an important question? We know that families want to be able to access affordable out-of-school childcare, and this is particularly important during the school summer holidays. So our manifesto commitment to us is to establish a new £1 billion fund from next year to help create more accessible childcare, including before school, after school, and in those summer school holidays. And as with all future commitments, this is dependent on on the outcome of the spending review, but I hope to be able to update the House with further details following the spending review. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, nurseries in West Berkshire suffered a loss of fee income during the lockdown, 
and they're now anxious about a reduction in parental demand going forwards. They are grateful for the guaranteed funding until the end of this year, but what assessment has my honourable friend made of, per, of the recovery of parental demand, and what assurances can she give the sector for the rest of the academic year? Uh, th can I start by thanking childcare providers, both in West Berkshire and across the country, for providing such essential support for our very youngest children. And this term, obviously, we've committed to block buying those hours from providers, provided they're open, uh, regardless of how many children are attending. And local authorities should pass that funding on. We're obviously looking very closely at the situation for next term, and the future funding will be dependent on the funding review. But the really good news is that attendance is increasing, and and, um, on the 1st of October, the numbers show that it was about 80% of the pre-COVID usual daily levels of attendance. Heading up to Hampstead to Shadow Minister, tulips a day, tulips a day. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Data from Ofsted shows that the number of nurseries and other childcare providers with coronavirus cases has, on average, been doubling every week since the start of September. And yet many early years workers can't access COVID tests or get quick results, forcing them to stay at home. I've heard from a nursery in Surrey that has been forced to close as a result affecting 40 children and depriving their parents of childcare. Will the minister confirm if childcare workers still qualify for priority testing? And if so, why are they not getting it? Thank you. Yes, I can absolutely confirm that education and childcare workers, including those in the early years, are essential workers and have priority access via the online booking portal. And this has been the case since April of this year. Do, Thank you, Mr Speaker. We have been working closely with the Secretary of State for Transport to ensure that young people can travel and continue to travel to their place of education during the coronavirus pandemic. We have made £44 million available to fund additional dedicated transport to schools and colleges, and we will announce additional funding shortly. Mr Speaker, does the Minister accept that the Government has a responsibility to ensure that local authorities have the funds available to operate low-cost travel schemes, like System 1 scheme in Greater Manchester? And does she agree that it is unacceptable for the Treasury to simply devolve cuts which will ultimately impact upon young people? Uh, thank, you. thank you for your question. Uh, of course, we have taken very seriously the issue of ensuring that children can get to school and colleges. There has been an extra £2 billion in funding to help people walk to school and to, to make it safer for them to get to school, but in addition to that, £44 million for dedicated transport. So the Treasury is putting a lot of investment into this area. Question number eight, Mr Speaker. Um, as part of a £160 million invested to support remote education, over 220,000 laptops and tablets have already been delivered, uh, with 40,000 routers additional to that. We are now supplementing this support by making available a quarter of a million additional devices in the event of face-to-face -face schooling is disrupted. This represents an injection of nearly half a million laptops and tablets for those most in need. Well, Matt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. But from the 22nd of October, schools will be required to provide remote education to those pupils isolating because of coronavirus. Ofcom estimate that up to 1.78 million children in the UK have no access to a laptop, desktop or tablet at home and for whom this policy will fail. With less than two weeks until the changes, how can the education of these children be guaranteed and is it not time to ensure that every child entitled to a free school meal is provided with internet access and an adequate device at home? The Honourable Lady will probably be familiar with our policy of the fact that we have set up support for those schools as they are in a position where they will have to provide uh, remote education for children, uh, making sure that those children from the most disadvantaged backgrounds are properly supported by this programme and investment of half a million laptops. Logan. Question number nine, Mr Speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, with your permission, I'd like to answer questions 9 and 10 together. Uh, whilst the vast majority of children are back in the classroom, if face-to-face -face education is disrupted, we have made 250,000 laptops and tablets available, building on over 220,000 already delivered to those most in need. And we have also made resources available to schools to deliver high-quality online education alongside the government-funded Oak National Academy, which is providing video lessons across a broad range of subjects. Well, no, good. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And, uh, can my right hon. Friend set out what measures this government is putting in place to ensure disadvantaged children um, right across Bolton have extra online support to get through the winter of COVID and put a spring in their step in 2021. Uh, thank you. It is, uh, it is vital uh, that students uh, have a spring in their ste step and that they have access to high quality remote education. So we have invested over £160 million on connectivity, on devices and on support, including over 980 laptops and tablets. Uh, to Bolton Council, uh, alongside additional devices delivered to Academy Trust, and we are now making 250,000 more devices available nationwide in the event of further disruption. And Bolton schools, to be pleased to know, uh, and academies have already received over a million pounds in their first payment of the catch-up premium. Let's head to Lincoln with Carl McCartney. Carl McCartney. Thank you, Speaker. COVID-19 has had a detrimental effect on some of the most underprivileged children in our society. As an example, and my honourable friend will remember a Westminster Hall debate in September 2016 on this issue, a white working class boy, an example that represents a substantial amount of pupil numbers in Lincoln, is 10% less likely to participate in higher education than any other ethnic group or gender. What is my honourable friend doing and what has he done to ensure we close this gap and that the ongoing pandemic does not make the situation worse? I do remember that important debate uh, uh, that uh, my honourable friend uh, secured. And I share my honourable friend's determination to see uh, the academic attainment gap between disadvantaged pupils and others close, including uh, white working class boys. And this has been at the core, Mr Speaker, of all our education reforms since 2010, particularly the focus on phonics in the teaching of reading, on the evidence-based approach to teaching maths, and on a more knowledge-based curriculum. And since 2011, the attainment gap has narrowed between disadvantaged pupils and others by 13% at Key Stage 2 and by 9% at Key Stage 4. And the £1 billion catch-up premium, with £350 million specifically targeted towards disadvantaged students, is designed to address widening attainment gaps caused by measures taken to tackle the COVID pandemic. Substantive question to Minister Donlan from Richard Bergen. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Government is working to ensure that all students have access to digital learning, including helping providers draw upon the existing funding of £256 million for the year 2020-21 towards the purchase of IT equipment and wider hardship support. The Government expects universities to continue delivering high-quality academic experiences for all students. Let us head up to Leeds to Richard Bergen. Richard Bergen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Education Secretary should have seen new analysis today showing infection rates on universities' campuses are up to seven times than those in surrounding areas. There are fears that this will spread the virus to higher risk groups in the local community. The Government should have moved teaching online before term started, as the UCU recommended. So, will the Minister now accept the Government's error in not doing so and instruct universities to now move to online learning as a default? Or will the Minister and the Government continue to play Russian roulette with the lives of students, staff and local communities? Mr Speaker, this Government has prioritised education. We do not believe it would be right to put the lives and the academic journeys of students on hold. Whilst it is a small proportion of university populations that have COVID, it is an awful experience for every student that is having to self-isolate. And that is why it is so important that the support is there for these students, from providing food to mental health and wellbeing. And I was pleased to see the U UK statement last week detailing the commitment of the sector towards this, which is in line with exactly what the government expects. Shadow Minister Emma Hardy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. During the Education Select Committee last Tuesday, the Minister was unable to answer how many students are self-isolating and therefore totally reliant on accessing digital and online learning. 
She was also unable to answer how many students have COVID-19, how will we ensure the tests are available to students, when the two-week late imminent guidance with robust FAQs on students returning home for Christmas will be published, or even how many students are currently learning online only. What impact does the Minister think her government's incompetence and inability to answer basic questions about COVID-19 in our universities is having on the spread of the virus in university towns and cities? Thank you, Mr Speaker. I will begin with the Christmas guidance, which is certainly not late, but I'm sure that my honourable friend would understand it is important that we get this right. I'm working with the sector, with a sub-working group of the task force, to identify the issues and ensure that comprehensive guidance is forthcoming, but that commitment to students on Christmas remains. Around 9,000 students um, currently have COVID. This is the data that has been sent to us by universities. It's a cumulative number of cases over the last seven days and is based on a student population of about 2 million. Public Health England inform us uh, that 68 universities have outbreaks. We then go back to those universities to ascertain that data. And as of next week, we will have a new data regime working with the OFS, which will be much more transparent. We now have a substantive question on behalf of Vicky Foxcroft to Minister Ford. Minister Ford. Thank you. Children with special educational needs and disabilities have faced many challenges during the pandemic, and some of them will find returning to school difficult. But the good news is that more than 80% of those with EHC plans are now attending. We have published guidance and resources to support schools to re-engage pupils with learning. We are increasing high needs funding by a record amount of nearly a quarter over a two year period, and we are also providing an additional £1 billion in catch up support for schools. Heading to Vicky Foxcroft. Vicky Foxcroft. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I asked the Education Secretary on the 2nd of July and again on the 7th of September about support for children with SEND during the COVID 19 catch up. He said he would write to me, but that letter has not been forthcoming. So I ask again, what assistive technology is being offered as part of the distribution of laptops and tablets to enable pupils to work from home if needed? Will the minister provide an answer this time or will I have to do this again next month? Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am enormously proud that we are one of the few countries in the world who ask schools to remain open for vulnerable children, including those with the most severe disabilities. And whilst we know that they couldn't all attend due to their own circumstances, it is incredibly important that they all get back to schools. Regarding remote learning, to support schools in delivering remote education, we delivered a range of resources and guidance, including specific support for children with young people with SEND and obviously those who were then also in, are eligible for the laptops receive laptops and devices as part of that programme. Stuart Anderson. <laughs> Number 14, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Department is committed to the continuation of high quality education uh, for all pupils. We have asked that every school plan for the possibility of local restrictions to ensure continuity of education. We have published a direction which provides an express legal duty on schools to provide remote education where needed. Anderson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In our mission to level up, I am keen to ensure that every child has the resources and support they need to thrive. What is the Secretary of State doing to ensure that the most vulnerable children and those with complex needs can have everything they, that they need to thrive during this time, like the wonderful children at Penfields in my constituency? Uh, my honourable friend and uh, constituency neighbour is right to highlight the brilliant work of Penfield School that not only serves his constituents but mine as well. And if I can also highlight the wonderful work of Whittick Hall School, which is in my constituency and also serves his constituents as well. And they're doing an amazing job all the way through this pandemic. But it's right to say that how can we support them more. That's why, in terms of uh, COVID catch-up funding, the support that we're providing there, those special schools are getting three times the rate of those schools, um, the, those mainstream schools, recognising the extra challenges that they have to deal with. 
Henry Smith. Question 15, sir. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, exams are the fairest form of assessment. Ofqual have confirmed changes to A-level assessment content, and we have announced today a short delay uh, in the exam timetable to free up teaching time to ensure, to ensure exams remain a fair assessment for all. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Significant concessions were understandably made uh, for A-level graduates this year because of COVID-19. Uh, but for next year's A-level students, uh, what plans are being developed to ensure that they aren't disadvantaged uh, as a result of university places next year? Well, the government uh, and universities, we do understand what a, a difficult time uh, young people have had, and we're committed to work together to support the 2021 cohort. This is a key priority, and we're also working with Ofqual and the exam boards to consider our approach to exams and assessments in 2021. Tom Rundle. Question 16, sir. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With permission, I will answer questions 16 and 17 together. We announced a package of measures in May to support the sector. We have also issued guidance on reopening, reflecting advice from SAGE, and we have worked with universities, ensuring that they have outbreak plans that are shared with their local Public Health England teams, and we will shortly provide additional guidance on winter planning and the end-of-term preparations. Bob Randall. And I'll be for that answer. A constituent of mine who is also an associate lecturer at Nottingham Trent University wrote to me to say that a safe start to the new academic year would be a boost in a year that has been awful in so many ways. Can my honourable friend tell me why it was important to reopen universities? And would she also agree, as my constituent has suggested, that specific testing and monitoring systems for universities might help to put in a, um, a safety net uh, amongst a very close knit group? Thank you, Mr Speaker. This Government has prioritised education. We simply cannot ask students to put their lives on hold or their academic journeys. To do so, Mr Speaker, would mean removing opportunities, damaging social mobility and punishing young people. The education and also the welfare of students is at the forefront of all of our decisions, which is why we have worked and continue to work with the Department of Health and Social Care to ensure students get access to tests if symptomatic, so that the trace work can kick in immediately. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week I spoke with several constituents who are students whilst they're at university, and I think it's fair to say, as per the Minister's previous answer, that education and welfare in many respects has a lot to be desired. Could the Minister in the Department help me understand why several universities are not giving face-to-face -face teaching at all, even in an socially appropriate socially distanced way, being extremely draconian with the way that certain students are being treated in terms of their social contact, which is a critical part of being at university, and some are even charging £18 a day for food parcels. Now, could the Minister put appropriate pressure on these universities, not all of them, but those that are not performing, to sort this out? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Universities are offering blended learning unless they have moved to a higher COVID higher education tier in conjunction with their local Public Health England team. But let me be clear, no university should seek to profit from students self-isolating. And reported charges of £18 a day for food parcels are quite simply outrageous. Students self-isolating in catered halls should receive free food, whilst other students should receive food which is either free, like many universities, including Sheffield, Hallam and Edge Hill are doing, or at a price which can be afforded within a student's budget. Mr Speaker, I have spoken to many universities on this, and I am also writing to make the point. Sir David Evans. Question 18, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Uh, we have published speci specific guidance to support the full opening of special schools, recognising the additional challenges that they face. Uh, we have announced a package of support worth a billion pounds to school, which includes a £650 million catch-up premium, with additional weighting for specialist settings. Uh, we are also increasing the high-needs funding by an additional £1.5 billion over this year and next. Sir David. Whilst I visited the excellent Fairways Primary School in my constituency this morning, I have been contacted by two special schools, Estuary High School, who are having difficulty in getting tests for their students in their residential homes, and Kingsdown School, who were very worried about the new guidance issued on the 28th of August in terms of social distancing. Will my right honourable friend look at those two points for me, please? 
I'd be very happy to look at those two points highlighted by my honourable friend. Uh, all schools are issued sets of kits and they do have the ability to uh, order more testing kits uh, via the NHS portal and be very happy to look at those points that uh, my honourable friend raises. Antony Buckley. Question 19, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Certainly getting into the steps today. Uh, with permission, I'd like to answer questions 19 and 20 together. Schools have continued to receive their core funding throughout the COVID-19 outbreak and have been able to claim funds to meet certain exceptional costs in the period between March and July. We have so far paid out £58 million to schools with further payments due later this autumn and we are also providing £1 billion in catch-up funding. And the Department of Ministers regularly meet school leaders on a range of COVID-19 issues, including in relation to costs faced by schools. Mr Speaker, I have been going back to school and in doing so I have been speaking to a number of head teachers and principals who are increasingly alarmed about the costs that they have incurred around PPE spend. Can I ask the Minister what he is doing to assure them that their budgets will not be stripped and that they will be able to recuperate some of those losses? Uh, well, schools have continued to receive their core funding and should be uh, using this to support their COVID-19 expenditure and have also been able to claim up to £75,000 to meet certain exceptional costs in that period between March and July. Um, Brixham College and King Edward the Sixth Community College have applied uh, for, to the exceptional cost funds and King Edward the Sixth has received payments and Brixham will be receiving payments shortly. Ali Reeves. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Head teachers in my constituency tell me they are having to invest significantly in extra cleaning procedures and safety measures, as well as extra staff to cover periods of self isolation. Further, many schools have also lost reliable income streams from hiring out spaces and fundraising events. Even before COVID-19, school budgets were already stretched after years of cuts. So with the pandemic set to continue, will the Minister commit today for extra funds for schools in the months to come? This year is the first year of a three-year funding settlement for schools. It's the largest increase in school funding uh, for over a, a decade. £2.6 billion more funding for schools this year. And in her own constituency, per pupil, pupil-led funding will rise by 2.2 per cent this year. We now come to Shadow Minister Margaret Greenwood. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Last week, the schools minister told me, that, as he's, um, as he's just alluded to, that schools have already submitted claims for £148 million for help with the extra COVID-related costs that they face between March and July. As the minister just said, the government so far paid £58 million to schools for help during that period. So why is it that the government accepts that schools needed that additional help with the COVID costs earlier in the year, but is now ignoring pleas from head teachers for the resources they need for COVID-related costs from September onwards? And when is the government going to recognise the significant extra costs of supply teachers required when staff self-isolate? Well, uh, she is right, Mr Speaker, that schools have been able to claim for exceptional COVID-related costs in that period March to July. Our priority now uh, as schools reopen to all pupils is to target the available extra funding on catch-up, supporting schools to help all pupils to catch up lost teaching time when schools were closed to most pupils. The £1 billion catch-up funding includes £650 million distributed on a per-pupil basis to all schools, which means that a typical 1,000-pupil secondary school will receive £80,000 in extra funding this year. And this is on top of the three-year funding settlement I mentioned earlier, uh, the biggest funding boost for schools in a decade. 22 withdrawals. Shall we go to Stephen Steve Number 23, Mr Speaker. Thank you. Um, we are putting an extra £730 million into funding those with complex special educational needs and disabilities next year, which represents a 10% increase year on year in the high needs block. And that comes on top of the £780 million increase for this year, which means that the block will have grown by £1.5 billion, which is an increase of nearly a quarter. In Hertfordshire, funding for the high needs block will grow by 24% over that two year period. Stephen Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I welcome the increased government funding in Hertfordshire, but the County Council does not pass it through to families in the front line. 
There are cutting fu there are cutting funding to our DSPLs. They're overwhelming our ch child and mental health services. They're focusing on process instead of our children with SEND. Will the minister undertake a review into the real accessibility of services, SEND services in Hertfordshire, and help me hold them to account so we can fix SEND in Hertfordshire? Can I thank my honourable friend for his concern for the young people of Hertfordshire and their families? The Government is undertaking a major review of the special educational needs and disabilities system. It is a major priority for the Government and it is considering improvements to make sure the SEND system is consistent and high quality and integrated across education, health and care. And importantly, it works with parents and carers and families to make sure that they and their children are at the heart of the system. 24, sir. Mr. Thank my honourable friend for his question and um, for his support for apprenticeships. Apprenticeships will be more important than ever um, to support our economic recovery and uh, in helping businesses to recruit the right people and develop the skills they need to recover and grow. To help support employers to offer new apprenticeships, employers can now claim £2,000 for every new apprentice they hire under the age of 25 and £1,500 for those aged over 25. John Howell. As a country, we rightly champion, champion our, our, our wonderful universities. However, we are often too slow, particularly in schools, to promote apprenticeships. Yeah, yeah. Uh, will my will my rural friend assure me that she is doing everything in her power to ensure that apprenticeships are seen as a valid part of our education system? Yeah, yeah. I can reassure my honourable friend that as a former apprentice, this is very much um, at the forefront of uh, my uh, focus. The Prime Minister and the Chancellor also have made it absolutely clear that further education is now more important than ever. That is part of the reason why we are introducing once-in-a-generation reforms to the FE system through our skills white paper, underpinning the progress we are already making with T-levels, which is backed by £500 million funding per year, investing £1.5 billion in the transformation of FE College's estate, and and investing £2.5 billion through the National Skills Fund, introducing a new entitlement for adults without qualifications at Level 3. Shadow Minister Toby Perkins. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. The Minister is right to say apprenticeships are more important than ever, but for all its rhetoric, the way the Government has introduced the apprenticeship levy saw Level 2 and Level 3 apprenticeship numbers falling to their lowest level for a decade before coronavirus. Since then, we have seen generous incentives on the new Kickstart scheme much less generous incentives for apprenticeships. So, for all that the Minister says, why does this Government's policy so consistently introduce policies which have the effect of reducing the numbers doing Level 2 and Level 3 apprenticeships? I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his question. And he refers, I think, to the switch from frameworks to standards, which did have an impact on some of the numbers. But it was most important that we focused on the quality of apprenticeships. There were a number of apprenticeships very early on, as we introduced the reform to the system, that were not of the desired quality. And for every young person, it is important. They put their trust in us. They put their trust in the apprenticeship provider. They put their trust in the employer. It's most important that they get a very high quality apprenticeship. And that's what it our focus is. Virginia Crosby. 26, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Government encourages the study of STEM subjects at all stages, which is vital for our economy and to drive productivity. For higher education, we are removing loan funding barriers for part-time STEM study at equivalent or lower levels and piloting graduate conversion courses for studying engineering, computer science and artificial intelligence. Crosby. Mr. Speaker, in my constituency of Arnest Morn, I'm working with colleague Menai, M. Spark, and the team at Bangor University to organise an innovation jobs fair. How is the Minister encouraging innovative companies like Dyson to invest in the next generation? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Dyson's UK site is actually based just outside my constituency, and I must declare that they have sponsored twice the Wiltshire Festival of Engineering, which I have organised. And I'm delighted that, as of last week, the pioneering Dyson Institute will be able to award its own degrees. A business taking this step is revolutionary. And I hope that many more will follow to give students a much more diverse choice in higher education and ensure that we can deliver the skills that this country needs. We now have a substantive question to Minister Gabe from Janet Davey. Minister. Required to teach religious education to all five to 18-year-olds, 
Uh, any concerns that a maintained school is not meet meeting this duty should first go through the school's complaints procedure. And if the complaint is not resolved, then the issue can be escalated to the department's school uh, complaints unit. Let's head to Lewisham with Janet Davy. Janet Davy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Religious education helps children to grow up with an understanding and respect for people from different religious, ethnic and cultural backgrounds. It is also a statutory requirement, but the Religious Education Council tells me that 40% of all schools give no hours to RE in Year 11. Does the Minister agree with me that they need to do better to support schools to ensure they are meeting their obligations to teach RE? Uh, well, I agree with the Honourable Member. A good quality uh, religious education can help to develop uh, children's knowledge of the values and traditions of Britain and other countries and foster uh, understanding amongst different faiths and cultures. At a national level, the proportion of time secondary schools spend teaching RE has actually remained broadly stable. It was 3.2% of all teaching hours in 2010, and it's 3.3% in 2019. Caroline Dole. Question 28, please. Uh, we continue uh, to believe that exams are the fairest uh, form of assessment and today uh, we announced our plans for next summer's uh, Year 11 exams to take place, the GCSEs, and we will work with Ofqual to engage the sector in planning for a range of scenarios of potential disruption to exams to ensure students get the results they deserve. I welcome my right hon. Friend's written statement of today and thank him for ending the uncertainty that was facing pupils, teachers and parents alike. Please can he reassure constituents like mine, 15-year-old Charlotte, who wrote to me a couple of weeks ago and inspired this question today, that next year's exams will take into account the disruption that there has been to their learning whilst uh, allowing them to demonstrate their ability and what they've learnt over the past few years. But please will he reassure her that there will be further detail as to how that will be achieved coming very soon. Well, my right hon. Friend raises an important point, and we do believe that the subject-level changes to the content of assessment that was uh, confirmed by Ofqual recently will reduce the pressure on students and free up teaching time. And combined with the timing changes to exams announced today, this does free up more teaching time uh, to help address uh, any unfairness. On top of that, as I've said before, there's a £1 billion catch-up fund, and we will have more to say uh, later in the autumn about the issue of grading. Yeah, yeah. Number, number 29, please, sir. I will answer questions 29, 30 and 31 together. We are taking unprecedented action to help schools support well-being, including the well-being of education, return training and uh, world-leading trials on ways to promote mental health well-being. Disadvantaged pupils will receive high-quality tuition through the £350 million National Tutoring Programme, and we continue to provide schools with a £2.4 billion pupil premium. Debbie Abraham. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have seen the educational attainment gap between disadvantaged and advantaged children widen over the past decade, especially for children with special educational needs and disabilities. On top of this, earlier this year, we, we heard from the Education Policy Institute um, that this attainment gap had widened during COVID. So what is the Secretary of State's assessment of the impact of COVID on levelling up for SEND children? Well, I think the Honourable Lady and myself have a shared passion to make sure that we close that gap, making sure that children, wherever they're born, anywhere in the United Kingdom, have the very best opportunities in life. And as the Prime Minister himself said, that uh, talent and ability are incredibly evenly spread in this country, but opportunity is not always done so. I touched upon in an earlier answer to my honourable friend the fact that we have put a three times waiting for those children with special educational needs in terms of the COVID catch-up fund, making sure that extra support is channelled that way. And I'm sure that the honourable lady has also uh, welcomed announcements that we made, not just last year, but also this year, which saw uh, a total of £1.5 billion worth of extra funding being channelled into high-needs funding in this country over this year and next year. I'm Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. The, the programmes that exist to encourage and inspire bright pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds to access top universities have been severely impacted this year. The application deadline for Oxbridge Medicine and Dentistry is on this Thursday. What action is the uh, Minister taking to ensure this year's state school pupils 
who have already been disadvantaged because of reduced teaching time and mentoring get a fair crack of the whip. Yeah. I'm sure that the Honourable Gentleman welcomed the news this year where Oxford and Cambridge welcome more state school pupils than they've ever done before. We want to continue to build on that. We want to ensure that every higher education establishment makes sure that all the opportunities that are available um, that they can offer are available to every single child, whatever background that they come from. Speaker, tackling rising levels of food poverty would be one good way of improving the well-being of disadvantaged children and uh, helping to raise educational attainment. So why won't ministers extend the Holiday Hunger Food Vouchers programme to half-term holiday and to Christmas holidays? It would be incredibly successful holiday activity programme that we saw rolled out uh, across many areas of, uh, uh, of England. We are looking at what more we can do on the, uh, in these areas and also recognising the important role that actually schools play in supporting pupils in their learning but also supporting their families as well. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We are working across government and closely with the higher education sector to provide both practical and financial support through the COVID-19 outbreak. This includes publishing reopening guidance to universities informed by SAGE advice, lifting caps on domestic medicine and dentistry courses for 2020 to 21, and providing both additional capital and teaching grant funding. I thank the Minister for her response and she may be aware that there are some concerns that the impact of the COVID pandemic on student experience uh, will see higher non-completion rates despite the, the best efforts of both students and staff to continue teaching and learning throughout the outbreak. If rates were to increase, would the Government consider allocating additional financial support to universities to help cover the costs of non-completion? Thank you, Mr Speaker. We have a task force that meets weekly, and non-completion is certainly something that we have discussed, but it is imperative that we support students to be able to continue and also complete their courses to unlock their future potential and opportunities, and that is something that this Government is determined to stand by and ensure happens. Sean Bailey. Question number one, sir. Secretary of State. Just say anything for a minute. <laughs> Thank you. I can't hear you, sorry. You're ready to take the question to Capital One as we've no further detail. Yeah. Okay, Sean Bailey. Mr. Speaker. Mr Speaker, for students in the Black Country, T levels and technical education are going to be absolutely vital as part of our story of coming out of this crisis. Now, my FE providers are absolutely committed to ensuring that we get this right, but there is some concern around the work experience time allocation element of it. So, would my honourable friend um, perhaps meet with me and my fantastic FE college of Samwell College to discuss how we can make sure this absolutely works for students in the Black Country? <coughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. T-Levels are a fantastic initiative that this Government has rolled out, and I certainly will speak to my uh, fellow colleague, the Minister for Skills, to meet with the Honourable Member and discuss exactly how this can be um, sorted. We've got the Shadow Secretary of State asking two questions to whichever Minister would like to take it. Kate Green. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Perhaps I can start by asking the Schools Minister a question as he's here. Um, the Secretary of State has repeatedly said that every child would return to school in September, and I support him in that ambition. Being safely back in school is best for children's well-being and learning. But the latest figures show one in ten pupils out of school as bubbles and year groups are forced to isolate uh, whenever a child or member of staff tests positive for COVID. Attendance at special schools, worryingly, is uh, down at just over 80%. Some teachers are reporting parents are withdrawing their children altogether to homeschool them. And we're not even in the start of winter yet, Mr Speaker. Yet hundreds of thousands of children already are having their learning disrupted. I think we can all agree that a functional test and trace system is crucial to keep teachers and children safely in schools. So how many pupils and staff are currently waiting for a test result or are forced to isolate? And why hasn't the government included school pupils in the list of priority groups for tests as the schools minister promised? 
Well, school teachers and head teachers up and down the country have done a tremendous job uh, in getting children back into schools. 98.8% 98, of schools are open uh, in this country, and of course, in special schools, some 80% of children with EHCP plans are, are in school. And in fact, we kept schools open for children with EHCP plans throughout the, the tackling of, of this pandemic. We have a very successful uh, test and trace scheme. That's why we're able to pinpoint uh, local outbreaks. That's why we have the statistics about outbreaks up and down the country. And by the end of this month, we intend... Oh, 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 oh Minister, Minister, please. Both, I'm going to say this to both benches once again. Topicals meant to be short and budget and not for the full-blown questions. If people want full-blown questions, do them early. I've got to get through topicals. Shadow Secretary of State to the Secretary of State now. I welcome the Secretary of State to his place, Mr Speaker. And on the 1st of October, he said uh, that people must be given the opportunity to retrain and upskill, but he's now announced that his, it's been announced that his department will be scrapping the Union Learning Fund, which supports hundreds of thousands of learners each year, many with little or no formal education. This scheme benefits workers, our economy and business. So this, um, getting rid of it must be either astonishing incompetence or playing shameless politics with people's life chances. Which is it, Secretary of State? And will he rethink this wrong-headed initiative? Yeah. Well, it probably wasn't worth a wait, Mr Speaker, but I, um, I, I'm, it's very kind of the uh, Honourable Lady to read out the TUC press release that they sent her. But the reality is we are investing more in skills and further education than ever before. That is why we're investing over £1.5 billion in capital in further education. That's why we're investing more in Level 3 A-level equivalent qualifications. That's why we're driving opportunities forward. And I will not apologise that if we think we can spend money that previously have been channelled to the TUC in a better way to deliver more opportunities in our colleges. Yes, we will do it in a better way, and that's what we're doing. Yeah. And can I just say, he will apologise to the House because it was rather discourteous for him to disappear. Craig Whitaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Many large companies who are net contributors to the apprenticeship levy are in the process of making redundancies uh, uh, with apprenticeships because of the downturn in, with the pandemic. In sectors like aviation, we see valuable engineering apprentices being made redundant by big names like Virgin and Ryanair. Can my right honourable friend look at the possibility with the Treasury to see whether, for a limited period only during the pandemic, that instead of making apprentices redundant, struggling sectors may be able to use the apprenticeship levy to pay apprentices to keep them employed and developing their skills? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, of course, I apologise for being a little bit late. I got uh, waylaid by a colleague asking a question uh, out of the chamber, and I didn't realise the speed at which the, Mr Speaker was working through the, uh, uh, the order paper. It was so much, so, so, so much more efficient than the last speaker, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, I, I turn to my honourable friend, who raises a really important question about apprenticeships and making sure that we support those youngsters who may find themselves in a situation where the company that they're working for, they're not in a position to be able to complete it. This is why we're working very closely across government to ensure that if a youngster or anyone of any age is in a position where they can't complete their apprenticeship, um, how we put in place the, the measures to ensure that they can do uh, and actually support employers to be able to continue to take on uh, apprenticeships, including the up to £2,000 that employers can benefit from by taking on apprentices. It's not my efficiency. 3.15 tells us when top will start. Carol Monaghan's waiting in Glasgow. Carol Monaghan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I was delighted to hear last week that the Scottish Tories now support the SNP's uh, policy on free university tuition, and I'm sure the Secretary of State will welcome this U-turn. But can he confirm that the Internal Market Bill will not undermine the ability of the Scottish Government to set university fees in Scotland or to continue providing free university tuition? The, the Honourable Lady seems to always miss the point that we live in a United Kingdom of four nations together where there is one single market and we have to ensure there is efficient uh, and a proper use of that market so that all four nations properly benefit. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In my constituency of Truro and Falmouth, our secondary schools are at near full capacity. 
With bigger year groups to come as the population of Cornwall continues to grow, would my right honourable friend work with me to explore the option of a, perhaps a new free secondary school for the children of my constituency? Well, my uh, honourable friend raises such an important point about uh, the importance of having the right provision in Cornwall uh, for her constituents. I know when I visited, visited her in her constituency, uh, I saw how she was campaigning so hard uh, to get the very best for all of her constituents. I'd be very happy to meet with my honourable friend to discuss this further and how best we ensure we deliver that brilliant provision that she is always rightly fighting for. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. By the end of this year, Stoke-on-Trent will have completed 104 kilometre citywide full fibre network capable of gigabit speeds. We have the ambition to create a UK leading digital academy in Stoke-on-Trent, offering something truly unique to the young people, like the Brit School in London does, and to have every school and college across Stoke-on-Trent connected to the full fibre network. Does all my right honourable friends share my excitement at this opportunity, and can he help us make it a reality? I don't just share his enthusiasm. I'm right there with him, cheering it on, making sure it happens. And I'd like to pay tribute to him and our other brilliant Conservative colleagues in Stoke-on-Trent and, of course, the Conservative leader of Stoke-on-Trent City Council, uh, Councillor Abby Brown, who has been driving this forward so hard. And we want to see all schools having that connectivity, having the benefits of what uh, the internet can bring for every single child in our schools. Jeff Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was at Cholton High School in my constituency on Friday, where uh, over a third of pupils have either no or very limited digital access, and it's a similar pattern across Greater Manchester. Now, more laptops, more laptops are fine, but they're no good without decent broadband. So, what more can the government do to guarantee, maybe with the internet providers, to guarantee broadband access for pupils who are out of school during this emergency? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's an important point that the Honourable Gentleman uh, raises, and of course, uh, when we looked at the provision of support for children, especially from the most disadvantaged, we weren't just looking at the, uh, the equipment in terms of laptops or the uh, tablets, but also the routers that go with them. Uh, we've also been working, along with colleagues from DCMS, uh, with major internet providers as to how we ensure that provision is available for all youngsters across the country. Anderson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Will the Secretary of State join me in thanking all the schools across Wolverhampton for the exceptional job they've done through the hardest of conditions? And when time permits, come and join me visiting King's, uh, Woodthorne or other great schools within Wolverhampton. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, it looks as if I'll be spending a day with my honourable friend as we tour Wolverhampton, which would be an absolute delight. Uh, to be able to do, and I look forward to joining him in terms of doing it. But if I can take the opportunity to thank not just those teachers, uh, not just those support staff, uh, but also uh, the parents, but most importantly the children, who have made sure that the return of schools has been such a success, with so many children getting back to school, having the opportunity to learn, and despite the efforts of some. Uh, this has been a success, and actually children are the ones that are benefiting more than any of us. Speaker, 1.7 million children across the whole of the United Kingdom with no access to a desktop, laptop or tablet device for learning while uh, away from school. That is the scale of the digital divide in this country now, and the impact of it will be with us for some years to come. What are the ministers doing, along with their colleagues in the devolved administrations, to make sure that we close that gap for once and for all? Well, Mr Speaker, we take this issue very seriously. We have already supplied 220,000 uh, laptops and tablets to schools and local authorities up and down the country. It's one of the biggest procurements of computer devices in the country. Uh, and we have plans in place for another 250,000 uh, uh, laptops. £160 million has been spent ensuring that people do have access to the internet should they need to self-isolate. But at the moment, 99.8% of schools are open, 90% of pupils are in school uh, uh, learning with their teachers. Mark Weston. Mr Speaker, the Secretary of State was claiming that more funding had gone into education than ever before, but he'll know that real-term funding for FE colleges has fallen by uh, 9% since 2013-14 to 2018-19. Will he meet with me and Warwickshire College Group to discuss their financial situation? Well, I'd uh, like to uh, pay tribute to his um, uh, predecessor, uh, Chris White, who is uh, involved in uh, uh, 
uh, but Warwick College's group has already made representations to me on this matter. We recognise that the college uh, sector uh, is, plays an important role. Uh, this is why we've been increasing the rate, this is why we've been increasing the support and funding, and we'll continue to work with the sector uh, to ensure we do everything we can to ensure it's not just its future stability, but its future success as well. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend has done great work making thousands of laptops, tablets and 4G routers available to disadvantaged school pupils. However, colleges like Kirklees College in Dewsbury do not qualify for the scheme and have to use their own funds to support their students. Does my right honourable friend recognise that these are tough times for colleges and will he assure me that he will continue to look at ways to support them? Well, this is why we have given extra flexibilities to colleges as well as making uh, learner support funds available for devices and uh, to cover connectivity costs, which I know is an issue that some students have faced. Uh, further education has to be at the very much of a heart of our recovery from uh, this pandemic. Uh, further education is able to reach into so many communities that in the past have been left behind. This will be a driver not just in terms of creating the life chances and the opportunities for so many young people, but it will also be what drives the productivity across all parts of the United Kingdom. And I look forward to working with my honourable friend, who is such a passionate advocate of not just the colleges in his constituency, but further education of colleges right across the co uh, country to ensure we deliver on it. Harry McCarthy, just in time. Mr Speaker, I hope the Secretary of State is aware of this recent report from the Children's Commissioner. It's called Unregulated and it's about children in care living in unregulated semi-independent accommodation. I'm bringing forward a 10-minute rural bill next month seeking to regulate the supported housing sector. And can I urge him to speak to his colleagues in MHCLG to see if we can all join together to support vulnerable people who need it? The Honourable uh, Lady speaks rightly with a passion and a conviction on this issue and one that is absolutely shared by myself. We want to see this ended. We want to see this changed. It isn't something uh, that we can uh, allow to continue. Uh, as the Honourable Lady will also be aware, the Department has cons uh, con uh, uh, done a consultation on this issue and will be uh, looking forward to bringing forward the results of that consultation in the not too distant future. It's incredibly important. These are some of the children from the most vulnerable backgrounds anywhere in the country, and we have a duty as a state to do everything we can do to protect them. Andrew Griffith, final. Mr. Speaker, the purpose of the Office for Students is that every student has a fulfilling experience of higher education. In light of the difficulties faced by undergraduates at the moment, will he commit to a post COVID review of the OFS? Uh, well, I will work very closely with the OFS to make sure that they are uh, working with universities, but making sure universities are delivering what students expect and students require in terms of their studies. Uh, we will always be working very closely with all government organisations to deliver the very best for students um, and uh, making sure that universities deliver on students' behalf as well. In order to allow the safe exit of honourable members participating in this item of business and the safe arrival of those participating in the next and suspending the House for three minutes, order.